The bone means of the action here. So not the limbs, the trunk stuff. So actually, the spine is only part of it. It's really all of, all of this stuff that we're talking about now. And so we're going to start with this picture. And I actually need the term list here for myself to make sure I can cheat a little bit. Um, but this is a place where I want to start. There's a question about uh, forces, low doses, and all that kind of stuff. Um, there also is a question, again, about convexity and concavity. So when I look at the curvatures of a spine, when I look at the spine from the front, for, or from the back, I want it to be straight up and down. I don't want side bending in there. That would be... When I, in here we look at normal, right? We look at, no, we look at, at textbook. We don't look at pathology. So first you look at what's, what's supposed to be, and then you look at what's, when it's wrong a little bit. And, and I can't use the word normal because normal actually means 50% of the people ha or more have it. So when you go to the doctor and you post 50 and you say, oh, you got neck pain, oh, you got arthritis, oh, that's normal. It's like, okay, that's fine, but what am I going to do about it? Because for some reason we just think like, oh, that means we have to accept it. But we still have to question what we're going to do about it because normal doesn't mean it needs to exist. So a, a straight spine is what we expect from the back and from the front. So now we can call it normal we know what the difference is. From the side, though, when I look from the side of the spine, I got a curve here a little bit in the back on the neck. I got a curve here a little bit. And I got a curve here a little bit. And I got a curve here a little bit. So it's not straight. So we have to describe those curves. When I start as a baby in a womb, my whole spine is gonna be curved this way. It's just rounded this direction. Hold on, let me make this bigger a little bit. It's just rounded, oh, that's just not that great. There you go, this direction. And then when the baby starts sitting up, so first you wanna protect its head, right? When it gets born. That's because the head muscles are not strong enough and it's all like this. At some point it starts holding the neck up and it starts doing this. And you start having this first curve up here develop. I should do this direction here. So that's that first curve up here. And then at some point the baby starts sitting up more and start walking. And then we got this curve down here that gets developed. And so at the end of the day, we end up having a curve in the neck, a curve in the mid back, a curve in the low back, and a curve then down at the sacrum again. The mid-back and the sacral curves start from being down as a baby. So we call those the primary curves. And then the neck and the low back are built when we're already in the world. We call those the secondary curves. The primary curves are down here. Chi a, I don't know how to call it off. But, uh, kyphosis. Kyphosis is the term we use for primary curves. So we got a kyphosis. We got a kyphosis here. And technically we got it also down in here. But the butt is just the given. It's not gonna move back and forth. It's just the way it is. This stuff can move, move because it's multiple bones made of. This is one bone, but it's just a, a, a remnant of it. And then we got the other curves, and they are described as lordosis. Uh, IS for one of them and they are the one in the neck then and in the low back that got created so those are the two curves those are the secondary curves correct the secondary they'll get created as we are in this world all right and then what's indicated here what often happens in the in the mid back we often get we often get a, a straightening we call that a hypokyphosis. Or we also sometimes get a, an overdoing it, a hunchback. And we could call that a hyperkyphosis. Hypo, a little less. Hyper, too much. Same down here. Very often we have a sway back or a flat back. This is a description of hypo. Too much would be hyper. So hyper would be this 
this this way, and I pull through the flat back. Very often we get that in the neck because as soon as you got a, uh, as soon as you got a, a, a car accident, you pretty much end up with a, a straight neck, and the curve is sort of disappeared. And so that's how we use those terms, um, and I think that's just pretty much enough there. Except I described the side bending already briefly. Down in here, if you look from the back, you want it straight. If you don't have it straight, we call that a scoliosis. Scoliosis. And that's the term for that. So, just to really goof it off, right? Then at the end, they also call these concave curves and these convex curves when you look from the back. If you didn't get that, don't worry about it. it took me a long time to get that. Oh, and here I think you have. Yeah, I see you actually have to turn concave and convex. Yes? So, how do they try to determine if something is concave and what is, what is convex? Like, from what side? You, look, they look, you look from the back. Oh, from the back? Mm -hmm. That's how I figured. Yeah, I know. I didn't know why, but. So, yeah, technically, that is a concave, so you're looking into the cave, and then here's convex, so it bends backwards the other way. That's the best way I can remember it myself. And so I just figured. It'll which, never be the other way? In a spine? Yeah. No. I've not come across that. And mostly I've seen it in medical reports when it's like side to side, not like, because, you know, if you read a report like, well, that concave curve in the neck is diminished, you go like, what a jerk you are. Why do you need to say that? The Lord knows. It's hypolordotic. You use the more modern terminology. But. Anyway, when we now get into the sections of the spine, when you look at the whole spine, we see all these little bones. Well, these are all little bones. You have that little thing on your table, right? The bony thing with all the, 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 the vertebrae. Yeah, that one. Um, we have, we have mo many of these bones make up the whole spine. So we got a, a section that's the neck, then we got a section that's the mid back, we got a section that's the low spine, the lumbar back, and then, and then the sacrum, the butt. In the neck, we have seven vertebrae that make up that neck. Seven of these structures. In the low, in the mid back, we got twelve of them. In the low back, we got five of them. And then in the butt, that's pretty much a sacrum. That's most. That's one of them, but it's fused. Five fused vertebrae. And then we have actually one more. It's called the coccyx. That's a tail. We used to have a tail. Did you know that? Yeah, didn't you see that? That's the remnant of the tail. And that's a very small little sliver of thing. We don't really study much about that. But it's also four fused original vertebrae. So your cat's tail has little vertebrae in it. So be careful about that. Don't twist it. It hurts. Uh, what else do we need to know about this part? Oh, yeah, the way we talk about it. When we look at the cervical vertebra. We use the terminology, cervical is C, and then we have seven vertebrae, we say C1 to C7. C1 is on top, C1 is on top, C7 is right there at the bottom of the neck before we get into the mid-back, the thoracic. And then, actually, let me show you on here because it's actually easier, because then the thoracic is the place where the ribs come in. So you got these ribs on the side, right? The ribs act up here. This is a rib right here. It's very high up. Almost goes into the neck. So if you're hurting here, it's probably a rib. I've been hurting here all day. It's probably a rib. Can I crack it? And nobody give me a big hug. So the, the ribs here, that's our first rib. So as soon as we see a rib, we know it's a thoracic mid-back. Thoracic mid-back. So then you see on the bottom, that's the last rib. So you know that's the last thoracic. You have to look at that. So the thoracic, so 12 vertebrae, so you call it T1 to T12, from top to bottom. And then lumbar is your low back. Lumbar is just after the ribs. It's just big stuff. The big vertebrae around there. So that's an L for lumbar, 1 to 5. We have 5 of them. And, and even if you are a giraffe, anybody a giraffe? No? You still have 7 up here. They're just really big. It's all the mammal stuff. They're all mammals. I know. 
is a proof that we are animals somewhere. Um, so now what we do with this, can I have one of those rings again, please? One of those rings again. So now we're, we're having this spine, and what we're doing is we're turning it this way, actually turning it this way, and I take one of these vertebrae that make the spine up, and I hold it this way, and then that's what I see here. You see that? Good. And what I do then is I describe different things on it. And those are sort of the structures that I want you to know on a typical vertebra. So this is not a vertebra from the neck or from wherever, or from wherever, just a typical vertebra. So don't try to figure out that part. Just label the stuff on it. So the, the things on this vertebra that are important for us is this big thing in the middle. That's called the body. Nice. Whenever something is big and looks like a body, it's often called a body. We appreciate that. Easy makes for easy learning. Everything else is hard, right? So from there, then we got this. We, we basically gotta make this ring because when we uh, make this ring of bone, we got a hole in between, and that hole in between becomes this big channel that the yellow stuff goes through, and the yellow stuff is called the spinal cord, and the spinal cord is an extension of your brain. So with it being enclosed in bone, is very protected. So that's really good. We want to do that. So that's really why we have this thing, and we call that thing, uh, that big hole in the middle, the vertebral foramen. When you see the word foramen, you think hole. Nerve type stuff, ver uh, artery things go through holes. Lots of holes like in the skull. You're going to learn a lot of foramens if you take an X up for class, right? Oh, no. I got this poster from this, this team at publisher. It's this big. It's just a skull from the top and a skull from the bottom. It's got all the holes. It's like, oh my lord, there's so many of them. So we learn one of them. Um, so the vertebral foramen is the hole in the middle of it. And then the bony part, we call the whole thing the vertebral arch. It's like, you know, it's an arch. You can walk through it if you look at it from this direction. You could, theoretically. But then we have different parts to that arch. And so the first part of that arch is, is right here, the, the stuff that comes off of that bone. And we call that the pedicle. And then from the pedicle, we're going to go towards the back. And we got another bar-like structure. We call that the lamina. And then we got stuff that sticks out of the, the pedicle and the lamina sort of thing. Uh, and, and when things stick out, you're always thinking of muscle attachment. That's a big, big piece for things sticking out. So there is one thing that sticks out to the side, and we call that the transverse process. The cross process. We got one on each side. One on each side. And then you got the last piece that sticks out in the back that's known as the spinous process. And actually, that's the stuff, if you touch the back of you, that's what you feel, the bumps. Those are the bumps. This is the spinous process, these are the bumps. And then you've got a few more parts that are a little more complicated. Let me see. On your list. Do you have your list? It says there's superior articular process and superior inferior articular process on the list on the typical vertebra. So when we look at, I want to not look at that vertebra from the top or from the bottom to describe that. I want to sort of look at the vertebra from the back and the front. So let me do that on the, on here. Yeah, this is a pretty good picture for that. So when I look at the spine, like from the side, let me from the side, that's actually even better. Uh, the, the arch that we described is, is, you know, you see the spinous here, you see the transverse here. But then right by the transverse, you, you find these joints, where you get these joints that connect to the other vertebra right there. And these are like sort of a little connection bar of bone right here that almost makes its own column on the side. 
on either side. And you can see that right here. Actually, I'll turn it around. You can see that right here. That's that part. I, is pretty well drawn on that. That's one vertebra of the neck only. And so all of them stack one another, make joints here, and then when we look at the whole weight of the whole spine, we have two joints in the back and one joint in the front that's gonna hold the bones are stacked on top of one another. And these parts, these bars are stacked on top of one another. So the, the, the vertebral arch, the predicle, the lamina, go around it, but then we also have a bar bone type level that goes up and down in the back. And those are known as the, um, the superior and inferior, uh, in, superior articular process and inferior articular process. See right there, you've got superior articular process is the stuff that can, connects to the vertebra above a little bit, comes up on top a little bit, and the inferior articular process is the one below a little bit. They just, and then here they, they see, they say here facet, see that word facet? That's that joint type, facet joint these two surfaces that just go parallel, that guide the motion. You don't need to worry about that word, don't worry about that one. I think this is, this is deep enough, so um, understanding that, that we have the arch that is made, but then we also have a column that gets made up and down. And the easiest way to visualize that was like this bone, and then it has on top of the bottom, it has more of those. I know, that's a little bit goofy, isn't it? But that's pretty much the making of a typical vertebra. Yes? So the facet is just a surface. Yeah, the facet is just a surface. Yeah, yeah. That's, so we can describe the cartilage a little bit when we have to say what's injured, you know. You've got to think of that. I mean, anatomy gets very detailed partly because we've got to describe what doesn't work right when it goes wrong. Um, and so from there, we only then describe differences to that typical vertebra as we get through the spine. Because the vertebra on the top are a little smaller, and then they got a little different, and then at the bottom they're just really big. So that's really our, our changes. But we have a few features that are unique. And one feature that's unique, well, actually, back up. The first two bones in the neck, they are actually totally different than what we just described. So let's back up and go to those. Everybody else looks kind of similar. But the first two are weird a little bit, because instead of having a body, the first bone becomes just a ring. And the body was here, was a body at some point, but that body now is this little thing that sticks out on the cervical tube vertebra. If you take your, your ring, your, your vertebra on your table, you got it? There's your ring vertebra, right? You see that? You have the ring, and then there's one that has a thing sticking out from the body. Like one like looking like that. You got that? Good. Those go together. The ring is the first vertebra in the spine, C1. C, C1, right here, C1. And the next one is the thing sticking up that then goes through the ring and holds the ring together to make sure the ring just turns around itself. That's called C2. That's the second vertebra. The, the, the thing that sticks out, we call that, that's the dens. We have to know that term. That's a dens. That's a specific term for that, only that word. Nobody else has that. <coughs> the first vertebra also is known as the atlas because in Greek mythology, who holds up the head? Who holds up the earth? The atlas holds up the earth. So we call that bone the atlas. And then the second bone we call axis because the fact it's got this thing sticking up and then the other one just turns around, it's kind of like this is an axis, in a, like an axle in a car kind of thing. I know, it's just, you know, that stuff does make sense. You just got to break it down like, really? But it is like that. It is what it is, right? But then that brings me to the other vertebra that come out underneath this C1 and C2 with this dens here. Now we get to this section. And one of the features that's unique about this section, if you take one out that's a small vertebra on that ring, and it's got a hole on the side. You see the one with the hole on the side? Yeah, that one. That hole is a vertebral foramen, is a, a vertebral artery goes through that hole. So that hole is unique to the neck vertebrae. If you see a hole like that, you know that vertebra comes from the neck. Even in a giraffe. 
It's just bigger. Then the other thing that the neck vertebra does, the spinous process splits in two. They call that bifurcate, bi, like a fork, bifurcate. And the reason why that's the case is when you, you bend your neck back where it's really heavy, like this person, you see that these vertebra, they jam into one another, but in order to not jam, that you can keep going, when the vertebra splits at the end, it lays one on, on top of the other one easier. You see right in here, right, right in here. And so that's why we have that bifurcated spinous. So if you see a spinous split, you know it's a neck vertebra. You know, just in case you find one on a beach, you know. I got my daughter, once she came in with a seal skeleton. I still have it. Oh, I see all the arthritis is perfect. And show the patients. And then we got the thoracic, the, 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 the section, the T1 to T12. The thoracic vertebra. And thoracic vertebra, what's unique about them is that the ribs go into them. The ribs anchor into them. And the ribs are really important. The ribs protect the lungs. That helps. But also, the ribs are really the anchor for the stuff from the upper extremities. Because if you look at an upper extremity of an arm, you're going to have a shoulder blade that's attaching to the trunk. And then from there, you're going to get the arm coming out. So very often, I get people, they have numbness and tingling in the wrist. And when you ask them, what did they do? They lift something really heavy, and their arm pulls, and their arm pulls on the shoulder blade, and the shoulder blade pulls on the rib cage, and the muscles attached to the rib cage get really tight. And then right here, the nerves come out, and they squeeze the nerves, and then you get tingling here. So you have to, you know, then all those connections become very, very important. Because if you just got tingling here, you don't want somebody to caught you here, and the problem was here. And they do that now. They do like nerve conduction velocity, like how long does it take the nerve to travel? They, they check that, and then they can see where is it impinged. Because you can have multiple places, and this is a classic. So especially somebody reach heavy, and then hurt themselves, or lift some, or not reach, reach far, and heavy maybe, you know, or lift something heavy and, and, and jerk on that, or from the back, and you get really tight in here, then that's probably your culprit. Suitcases used to be in the back, right? Now they're on the side. Part of that, I think. I mean, maybe not because they were thinking about it like that, but it just hurt. So anyway, the ribs. So what else we got on those vertebrae then that are unique? The ribs go in. Where the ribs go in, we got these, look at it, costal facets. Whenever you see the word costal, you think rib. Costal is rib. So we got the rib attached to the bone, so we got a little places there. You don't have to differentiate those, but it's good to know. And then we also got the rib attached to the, to the transverse process a little bit too. As it comes, when you see a rib, a rib comes in, inward from the back, it goes around, it touches the transverse, and then it anchors into the body of the vertebrae. So a lot of stuff. If someone has really a knife stabbing pain back here, it's probably one of those, you know the, the stuff that's around, the joint capsule? One of those joint capsules is squeezed, it really pinches and it hurts. And it's much worse than it, it is, but it feels like horrible. It's not as bad as it feels, but it feels like horrible. That's what I meant to say. So that's that. The other thing on that vertebra that's really unique that we see is the, and you see that on your uh, three vertebrae or that little thing you have, that one, the spinous process goes really down a lot. It's really long and sl slender, reaches down. So you could, if you need to differentiate, if I say, what's this vertebra, which section is this vertebra from? I hold one of those vertebrae. If you have a long spinous process in the back, you know it's a thoracic. And then if it's really big, if it's the biggest one on that, you know those vertebrae, right? The ones you have on the table. If the biggest one, I say, what section is this from the spine? You know it's from the lumbar spine. If it's the one with the hole in, you know it's from the neck. If it's the ring, you know it's the atlas. If it's the thing with sticking up the bone in the middle, you know it's the axis. That's probably about all you need to know for those in terms of recognizing them. Because then that brings me to the sacrum, and the sacrum is my favorite bone. Because it means it's a sacred bone. The sacrum is the sacred bone.
And the reason why the sacrum is, sacrum is the sacrum bone is because, do I have a sacrum? Can I have a sacrum? When you, in Greek mythology, they, they, they took the sacrum from an animal and it was like a plate. So they could use it to burn incense and stuff like that. So they call that the sacred bone. And, and I have a lot of back pain. And so in here, when somebody works on the sacrum right in here, that really feels good. So I have, that's like why it's another favorite bone too. But when you look at this, well, I do that all day long. I take my table, I pound here, boom, 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 with that my machine. And it feels good, they like it, so. When we look at the sacrum from the back, we got a few features that we want to talk about. When I ask you, name this bone, listen up, in the test. It's on the test. Name this bone, you say sacrum. Because I just want the whole bone. But then on the bone, I have different landmarks. So one landmark in the back is the remnants of the spinous process going up and down. We call that the median sacral crest. Median sacral crest. Then on the side, like going up a little bit, like on both sides, like here, you can see from the front much better actually. It's called a, a wing. You see it's like a wing, it's like you can fly. It looks a little bit like you can fly. Like wings. They call that the ala. Ala means wing. Sa sacral ala. And then what I don't have on here, but you can see it here, when you look in the, in the front, you see these, these lines right here. These are the remnants of the intervertebral disc, which is between all the vertebrae. But they're, they're no longer there. They're fused. They call that the transverse lines. Transverse lines. Write that down if you don't have it. Transverse lines. So that's in the front, from the front. Yeah? Yeah, just on this top, that's from the front, right? You see that, where I, I cross? They're the remnants of the intervertebral disc. When you see here, these, in between the vertebrae, let me talk about that briefly. In between the vertebrae, you've got these discs, intervertebral discs. The cushions. Herniated disc. You ever heard of herniated disc? Down here, see that's a herniated disc. So the, the, the disc is interesting. On the outside, you've got a shell, a fiberglass shell. Like, you know, fiberglass mesh. That, that there's a lot of fibers connected from, from bone to bone, very strong. And then on the inside, you've got a gel that's like motor oil. Like if it's cold, it's, ugh, it's grouchy. And if it's like loosed up and warm, it's okay, it can move. So that's why you wanna, if you have back pain, don't just get out of bed and jump in a car and then <laughs> you know move that stuff around a little bit. Go for a walk first to give it a little breather room. We need to do that. Because, for example, one pathology, one thing that happens, and I get this in the office sometimes, is people, they sit a long time in one position, and then they stand up and go, oh, and it shoots in the back. In German, they call that an Hexenschuss. That means a witcher shot. Is it a textbook? I can bring it to you, it's hilarious. It's like the devil chews you in the back somewhere. And, and what it is, is, is the inside gel, the motor oil, is not warm, it's cold, and it moves as a unit to one side, and it stretches the, the front, like those collagen fibers, it hurts like hell. And so sometimes, you know, it feels like, oh, I, I, I'm gonna die. But the intensity of the pain is just the body's language to say like, hey, chill out, you gotta, you know, it doesn't mean it's severe, it just means it's acute. Now you have to pay attention to it. Doesn't mean it's gonna be like that forever. But you better pay attention to it now. And that's where, of course, many dentists take pain pills, which is great for that moment, but then you think, oh, everything's fine. And you deaden the language of the body, and you say, shut up! I don't give a crap about you. And then 20 years later, I have no idea why I hurt so bad. I didn't do nothing. And you go like, really? <laughs> But that's how we are as humans, you know, out of sight, out of mind. 
just the way it is. That's why though, why we have to be careful about some some just numbing everything down because pain is the language. It's the only language in many ways the body has to speak to us. All right, sacrum. That was good enough, huh? Because I think I'm running out of battery here. The only thing I didn't talk about that is the sacral canal. And the sacral canal is the going up and down, where, where the remnants of the spinal cord go up and down. That's the sacral canal. And then that brings me to the, to the to sternum. And in the sternum, what do I need to look at? I need to look at the, um, uh, uh, the this is the breastbone, the sternum is the breastbone. And the breastbone is made out of two parts. The top part, we call that the manubrium. It's right up here. Well, right up here, you can feel that. And if you go down, if you go down, you feel a little angle. You feel a little, a little thing right there in the front. That's called the sternal angle. And above is the manubrium. Below is the, 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 the body of the sternum. And then when you go all the way down, you be careful, don't poke too heavy, it hurts. It's known as the siphoid process. Now that's definitely on the test. It's like xylophone, you can't get much cooler as a term. The xylophone process is often not real bone, bone, bone. It's more like cartilage type bone, bone, cartilage bone. But it's really sharp. And it's where the diaphragm attaches. And the diaphragm is a muscle like down in here, it goes like that. And if you breathe, it's the muscle that goes down, like a parachute coming down or a parachute is going up, but it flattens out. And when it flattens out, your lung volume goes up when you breathe in, your air just flows in natural. So that muscle is attached to the siphoid. It's very strong. If that, that siphoid breaks, the muscle pulls it backwards and it pierces the liver and goodbye. It's like a knife, it's that strong. So when you have somebody choke, have you ever heard somebody choke? Like they, you know, they can't breathe anymore. They go like that. You do the, have you heard of the Heimlich maneuver? Good. So when you do the Heimlich maneuver, you have, what happens is some food gets lodged in the food, in the windpipe. And when food is lodged in there, you can't breathe. Air can't go up and down because there's food in here. So you have to basically squeeze the abdomen as fast as you can to pop it up. Change the pressure, like reverse the pressure upward. And so what you do is you basically do that to the person really heavily to change that up. But you have to be very, very careful not to break the siphon. So when you do it, you put a fist here and then go below your fist and then you know you push in and up. You know, jerky. Like that. When you have a kid, you just put him upside down and you go like, you know, go like. <laughs> the pizza will come right out. <laughs> I have to do that with my kid once. The pizza came right out. That was Dobby. He was like one. It was hilarious. Uh, well, I mean, afterwards. Um, and the last thing we have is a rib, but I don't have a rib picture. Do we have a rib? Can I have a rib? Oh, look at that. It died anyway. No, it's not a rib. That's a rib. So when we look at the rib, when we look at the rib, the rib goes in like that. So the ribs are really goofy. They're not really round, just round. They're like angly here and then flatty here. So the flatty side goes to the front. It goes like forward and downward. Ribs don't go up, ribs go down. So that's an interesting thing. The other thing about the ribs is look at from the side, they're flat. They're really flat. They're not round bone, they're flat bone really, if you think about that. So we can break them easy. As an other piece, ribs get easily broken. When they pierce into the lungs, that's a problem. We'll talk about that when we get to the lungs. But let's look at this part, and it goes into the vertebra in the back. So you have a little bump at the end of one side there by the angle. That's known as the rib head, the head of the rib. And then you've got a, a flatter part below that. It's like our own head, that is roundish. Mine is a little different, but more or less. And it's round and then it gets flatter, smaller. That's then called down here the neck, like in my neck, it's the neck of the rib. And then you have another bump, and that bump is actually the place that 
connects to the transverse process, and they call that the tubercle of the rib. And then there is that sharp curve, and that's the angle of the rib. And that's for the rib. And then the last ones there, we have ribs that are, we call them true ribs, false ribs, and floating ribs. I have no idea who came up with that terminology. They're all equal. They're not wrong. They're all right ribs. But the true rib, so to speak, straight attach via a cartilage to the sternum. So you see here, that goes straight to the cartilage to the sternum. That cartilage goes straight to the sternum. But then after that, down here, that cartilage needs to go into this cartilage, and then it goes to the sternum. So that, that once that happens, we call them false ribs. So the true versus false means, is the rib directly through its own cartilage going to the sternum or not? That's the definition of it. And then the last two ribs are floaties. They don't have any cartilage collection, connection, so we call them floating ribs. You have to be careful when you massage them, but you don't go like that because you poke them and that might hurt. You go like that. I kind of, you know, or be very careful about it. Or somebody who's got like a short trunk, you have, you know, I have to be careful that I don't squeeze it. I had a patient, she's got bad scoliosis, so bad, she's 80 now plus, so bad that she came in, she's like, I can't walk, walk half a block, I, it hurts. We figured out the rib was touching the hip. I'm like, oh. <laughs> and so, we didn't really know, so we worked on it, and that was help. So we figured that was it. I know, you got to think anatomical. That's, what, that's one of those examples, like, I don't know, let me, you know, you got to just think about what the situation looks like, and then slowly the answers come. But what's amazing to me is, like, why didn't the doctor figure that out? And then you realize, you know, it, it is a very good value the more you know about these kind of things. You add, and, and modern medicine, to make the finish point on this, Modern medicine, in my opinion, needs an educated patient. Because you've got so much variability of what you get as treatment, you have to know what you're talking about a little bit. You can't just go with, oh yeah, oh yeah, okay. Because somebody's got a white coat on, or not even. We have to be thinking. That, that, that doesn't mean somebody's bad or good, but you know, often things are done because medicine is paid by insurance, and then that's what we utilize or that what is utilized, and so if things don't work, we gotta keep asking the question. I think that's what the message is with that. Anyway, that's all I have. How are you guys doing? Questions? Good. What are the floating ribs again? Huh? What are the floating ribs again? The ones that do not have any cartilage attachment at all. They're just bony stumps. They, they just go into nowhere. That's why you be careful they don't poke. You don't poke them. Just the last two. Yeah, the last two are floaters. So with that, though, then, I want you to, what time is it now? 